Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks uh, for joining us this week on the AAPI GoCast, September 30th edition. Um, as always, I'm your host, Scott, and uh, joining me this week and every week, uh, we have Eugene. Hello. And Raphael. Hi. Yep, so just us this week. It was a fun fun show last time with uh, Citizen Hush, and we're going to be having uh, you know new exciting guests coming up in uh, future weeks, but... Uh, we're back with the original crew here, minus Bobby, this week. So uh, should be a good time. Um, well, yeah, that everyone uh, has anybody been into the range this week? What have you been shooting? I think Eugene shoots a bit more than I do, but as yeah, always, I think, I've been I stocking think that's up on a job perk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you guys remember, I had bought the APC-10. Yes, how um, is that? And I was waiting on some ammo for it. It finally came in. Uh, I took a few shots with it. By the way, when FMJ costs the exact same amount as JHP, it it does weird things to my brain. Um, yeah, I found a I found a box of Tula and a box of Hornady Hornady. Uh, critical defense for the same price on one site and i was just okay yeah. what has the world come to um i mean thankfully it ran everything it's a swiss gun so i had hoped it'd run everything it's very flat shooting um it feels like a the recoil impulse is very similar to like a larger nine mil pcc but it's a shorter package firing a 10 mil cartridge and i think that's pretty neat the so it's not quite a uh are it's not quite tight. a vector but it's close yeah in terms of recoil mitigation which is weird considering it's only a straight blowback yeah <clears throat> i haven't been shooting anything new but i've been working on some new stuff uh, an AR-10 3D printed lower came out, and those are still legal for me to build and own, so I'm building one. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, nice little perk around uh, uh, NY New York's gun laws, I guess. Yeah, they're still a pain to make compliant, but uh, it, it, it looks like it's going to be pretty good so far. Uh, minimal hardware, very sturdy. I can stand on it without a problem. It's great. Yeah. Nice. And then uh, I would have been out at the range, because... I changed jobs. Now I can afford it, but I don't have the time. Life will get you. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when you're growing up and you, you know, say like, oh, man, when I get a good job, I'm just going to buy every video game imaginable. And uh, it's like I've got a PS5 and an Xbox and uh, I have no time to play them because of family. But, you know, <laughs> I lived my Relatable. childhood dream of owning them, but I just, you know, hardly have time to do anything on there. <laughs> that was your mistake. You never wished to play them. Yeah, what's the... Uh... Yep. What's the saying? When you're a kid, you have energy and time, but no money. When you're an adult, you have money and energy, but no time. And then when you're older, you have money and time, but no energy. Something like that. I think the saying <laughs> is condensed to uh, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Stern kids. Get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah. God. I, I forget, like, in the movie Gran Torino, does, like, Clint Eastwood actually say, get off my lawn at some point? He does, I think, w uh, with an addition of an expletive or two. Yeah, it's, get off my fucking lawn, and he's got, you know, like a double-barreled shotgun or something. There's our next venture, movie parodies. Yeah! That is true. Yeah, we should just uh, re recast uh, every famous Clint Eastwood thing with a uh, I like, I don't know, John Chu or something. That's uh, something that seems like he would be into. Although I'm not sure what his stance is on the Second Amendment, but. Yeah, I was going to suggest Red Dawn, but considering our niche, that's probably not the best option. Yeah, plus it already got remade and it was terrible. Yeah, and none of us are Chris Hemsworth, sadly. That is true. Yep. I did find it funny that they like had to digitally alter everything to be North Korea at some point um, because Chinese censors weren't like, allowed in the country. They didn't anyway, which is the great part. But yeah, they had to yeah. change out the Chinese flag for the North Korean flag, which was a uh, yeah, not widely reported, but still utterly hilarious. Yep. 
Yeah, it's sort of like uh, Superman having his mustache digitally altered out uh, in Justice League. You mean digitally glued over? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the CG waxing of the century. <laughs> nice. Ah, uh, well, speaking of waxing, I guess I'll wax philosophically about my uh, woes of my PS90. Um, you want to talk about weird, confusing requirements. Um, I basically, like, I had to take the upper after I got it registered and then send it in pieces back to Texas to do a pin and weld on it. Um, so that was fun. Um like they wouldn't let me do it before I had actually physically taken possession of it of the upper receiver and then gotten that all cleared and then I could send it back to them. So, but slowly coming along. I hopefully I'll actually have that in the hand uh, in the next couple of days cuz they're all all done with their uh compliant neutering work of putting a fake barrel shroud on there permanently. Yeah, well, or, once you leave California, it's really easy to change out, and that's the good part. Yeah, I might, like, SBR it. Like, they, I just found out recently, like, you can't do an SBR in California. Like, if something is considered, yeah. you know, off NFA roster. weapons, NFA things are prohibited in California, just like New York. We yeah. can't have suppressors, we can't have SBRs, we can't have short barrel shotguns, we can't have basically any of the fun stuff. You poor yeah. Fools. <laughs> yeah, even even privately owned full autos like that are fully registered and everything, those are illegal as well. And likewise, you're surrounded by states where you can just pop the border and it's everything walk, is uh, available. Yeah, walk, walk to Vermont from the Adirondacks and it's uh, not paradise since 2018, but still, they it's called Vermont carry for a reason before the term constitutional carry was invented. It's literally in their constitution that you can carry a gun lovely yeah I, i'm wondering if some of the original framers of that also helped with drafting the second amendment I have to check into that yeah i think the i think there's at least some uh shared philosophy between the two groups yep yeah cool well speaking of not history and into news um just wanted to remind everyone we are going to be having uh, another event coming up for sure in November. Um, it's either going to be the second or fourth Saturday of November um, at Field Sports Park in San Jose. Um, just going to be kind of like a general new shooter day. Um, so nothing too fancy like the uh, event that we had last time. But uh, yeah, if you're listening or watching and uh, you're in the Bay Area and are interested, come by and uh, say hi. We'll uh, start posting some details on Eventbrite uh, pretty soon here. Um, and we're also going to be hosting kind of a generalized non-gun-related safety class with a couple of good partners like Brian Wang and uh, uh, some folks that we met at the event uh, as a part of kind of a, a grant that we're applying for. So assuming that all goes through, that'll be, uh, that'll be happening soon too. Uh, cool. Let's see. And actual news stories. Um, thought it might be good to talk about, uh, some of the new red flag laws that were just voted into the house. Um, thanks to Joe Manchin, at least, uh, they probably have, you know, snowballs chance in, uh, heck because, uh, my daughter is here, uh, of passing, um, you know, <laughs> through the Senate. Um, but, you know, basically one provision would allow red flag complaints for the confiscation of firearms that are owned by uh, people in the armed forces if, uh, you know, they were subject to any sort of, you know, dishonorable discharge or, you know, complaints or things like that. Um, so it's essentially like allowing red flags for military people, which isn't good. Um, and uh, second provision basically undoes um, some export reform regulations that were uh, crafted by the Trump administration. Um, so, yeah, guys, any any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, so this is red flag laws are kind of a complicated topic. Um, in in terms of the principle of them, I don't actually disagree as long as it goes through a court. Um, I think that there are actual lives that could have been saved if these laws had either worked or you know been used. Uh, but as with all good, in uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and I think that's exactly where these go. Uh, these aren't going down a good path, and they aren't something we want to see where they go. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, right. um, basically, basically, 
they, they seem like a good idea to a lot of people. And I think that eventually like background checks are just going to be an accepted thing that we have. Um, and hopefully they're reasonable, but uh, I know a little bit too much about government to trust that these will be used in good faith. Yeah. So that, that more or less kind of falls in line with my feelings and my thoughts on it. <sighs> Something that a lawyer friend of me of mine told me um, a while ago that I didn't really like, but it is it is the way that the law is written, is unfortunately the Second Amendment, as much as I want it to be, is not unlimited. There are constitutional limits that can be placed, that have been placed and have been defended. Um, and one of those things is something similar to a red flag law or provision the issue is how it's enforced and how it's kept is it brought through due process that is where i think a lot of i want to use the word moderate but i don't know if that's the correct phrasing for it would also kind of fall on the sword there um they don't have a problem with a lot of laws as long as they are given constitutional rights against it like every other thing. If they're, you know, given um, a, a judgment by their peers and if it's brought through and they're able to defend themselves or, you know, again, just due process in general. But I feel like a lot more extreme feelings on it might just be no, none of it, never. And, you know, having talked with some people who, especially uh, former military people, who have told me that, you know, they are on board for the red flag laws for their past experiences, I get that. And so I think a good kind of, and I hate to use the word compromise, but compromise would be, you know, are they given due process if this becomes a thing? Yeah, I think like a court order depriving somebody of their firearms for a set amount of time where they're held in escrow by either, you know, a private party or uh, anything but a police station, essentially, because they have a habit of losing and or stealing things. Um, but I think that's that's reasonable. A temporary deprivation of freedom in order to protect the common good is um, there's plenty of precedent for that in the Constitution and in Supreme Court ruling sense. The problem is that I think the people who are pushing for this don't necessarily have the purest of intentions and want to perhaps push this a bit farther to, say, disarm political opponents, which is very, very, very bad. Um, and of course, Trump's comments about, you know, take the guns first, go through due process later did not help. Um, but I think uh, these, th these are a really complicated topic. And I think uh, what, sometime when we have an attorney on here, we should go into a deep dive about extremist protection orders and what those entail, what the constitutional limitations are. Cause I think they, they're, they're really interesting to me. Like they're one of the first gun control regulations that I've ever heard of that like didn't make me angry on the face of it. And that was kind of surprising because most of them kind of pissed me off. And this one just, I was like, okay, that this is, there's potential for abuse, but I don't see the, uh, the direct harm. Yeah. And it's, it's, kind of nice that like at least most red flag laws are sort of crafted to you know someone who has an immediate uh you know knowledge of the person so it's like me as concerned citizen reading about Raphael printing guns on twitter can't just like file a complaint it would actually have to be somebody in your immediate family or like a coworker. Which I think that's probably the one that I have like a little bit of an issue with because like I mean hey it's your coworker none of their fucking business, but you know an immediate family member or you know school potentially like I kind of don't have a problem with that. But to your point, it's like it's ripe for abuse in the wrong hands. Yeah, like I have I've had family members become uh, very depressed and I held on to their guns for a bit. And that was like a that was a reasonable precaution. This is kind of providing a legal framework for that, so, essentially. I think um, one kind of good example to bring into this is the Boulder shooter uh, from was it this year or last? Yeah. Year? Either way, I believe it was early this yeah. year or late last year. Um, um, yeah, I remember being 
feeling down from quarantine already and seeing that and just yeah. being like, oh, no. That was yeah. one of the situations in which, I mean, Colorado has has a red flag law. But nobody that could have, that was eligible to, to do anything about it, did anything about it. And I think that's the, the, the other yeah. issue along with it. You're putting the stipulations in place that other people can use and abuse, while the goal that it intended to complete is being completely ignored and wasted. I don't know. It's 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 a yeah, very I think weird that slope a lot to, of to talk and defend on, because with any other legal matter, you have to remember that the sword falls both ways. Yeah. Well, here's the – there's a common story with a lot of gun control regulations, and it's – if this was properly enforced, then we could have a reasonable discussion about it, but we can't because it's not. And I think this would kind of fall into that category. Um, how many school shootings have we heard of where there were many, many, many calls to all sorts of authorities about this person? And then, oh, no, we never saw this coming. Yeah, um, and like I think this is exactly – in San Jose is a perfect example too where like the guy literally had – complaints but he was in a union and union supervisors just kind of shuffle bad employees around and uh so they never actually brought it to the authorities even though he was actually like legitimately saying i'm gonna kill x employee that guy really pisses me off and there was like tons of complaints against him uh but all the leadership team within the uh san jose uh, valley transit authority just did nothing about it so cops weren't even looped in in that case I mean, there's also the important importance of context. Um, you know, saying you're going to kill somebody can actually be something said in jest. It's like a that that that's it can literally be banter. Um, and uh, I think anybody who's had brothers can attest to that. Um, and that that's another thing that I don't think could properly be addressed by this. But that falls under the category of say things like. Uh, credible threats versus incredible threats and yeah. that's a rabbit hole we don't want to dive down because i'm already tired and talking law makes me sleepy <laughs> yeah we we were we're supposed to have an actual lawyer on today there but uh he couldn't make it last minute uh so uh but hopefully in the next uh couple of weeks we will get him on the air and uh save a lot of those questions for then i guess yeah, I think uh, I think this is something that we should definitely retable or, or table for next time and uh, resume uh, because I think we could probably hear a bit more. California has red flag laws, do they not? Uh, yeah, they do. And you know, case in yeah. point, no one uh, no one took advantage of those for the VTA shooter. Yeah, I think um, I think we should ask our friend about that uh, when we can because I think uh, we'll get some interesting perspective that i don't think any of us could really give now eugene you live in a place without them as far as i know At the you moment. lucky bastard <laughs> <laughs> yeah pennsylvania is going going interestingly let's put it that way yeah well i mean, speaking of uh interesting statistics uh, across all states um scott you're getting yeah. really good at these segues i, I am say. i am i've been practicing <laughs> um <laughs> the well the fbi released uh their 2021 crime statistic reports um and it's, interestingly enough for the first time in four years the uh, number of violent crimes in the nation increased when uh compared to last year's statistics um so in 2020 violent crime was up 5.6% from the uh, 2019 number. Um, property crimes actually dropped by 7.8%. Uh, that and is, uh, that, that, That's confusing. It is confusing because you would think that, you know, a lot of murders are crimes of passion. Some, you know, popped up dude on meth brings a shitty 20-year-old Glock that he uh, got on the black market, gets jumpy and shoots someone. Um but apparently that's not where all the uh, murders well, are happening. We know that a lot of shootings are gang related and or drug related. And if you're a generally law abiding member of the population, it's not going to affect you. Um, but I'm kind of I'm, uh, given the political climate last year, especially I'm surprised that violent crime was up and property crime was down. Just perhaps I, I let the news bias me a little bit, but that that's not what I expected. Yeah. But yeah, last year was kind of a shit show. 
definitely. Yeah, I mean, the murder rate was like around 29.4%. Um, and interestingly enough, the report kind of breaks it down by weapon types. Um, and so I've seen like a couple of statistics out there, like people focusing on the fact that, oh, well, you know, deaths by rifle were only 2.2%. Um, you know, which is lower than hands and fists and stabbings um, and shotguns. But uh, lo and behold, handguns are responsible for the most overwhelming majority here. It's like 48% of uh, murders by weapon type. Yeah, that's not surprising at all. Handguns are very, very common as murder weapons. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I would be interesting to see, like, in the report, like, how many of those handguns were stolen uh, versus, like, first-time gun buyers. I mean, I bet it's, like, just based on previous year's statistics. I mean, I saw something, like, the FBI report on that a couple of years ago uh, said it was something like 75% of all handgun shooting deaths were from stolen handguns or guns that were just like in circulation and recycling around gangs or, you know, fell out of the back of a police yeah. locker. Essentially. Um, well, I think Eugene would know more about this than both of us. Cause given that he is closer to a range uh, than either of us, but I don't believe the, that the flow of crimes generally goes, uh, go to gun store, buy a handgun, go shoot somebody with it. That's extremely yeah, rare. Um, so I actually did. Uh, there's a FFL in my area that uh, a lot of my coworkers and I are, are kind of good friends with. Um, and every time I go to his uh, shop to do a transfer, he usually gives me an update on some of the winners from the past uh, few weeks of people failing different you know, background checks or him being uh, given a call by the police being like, hey, this guy's going to be coming in. Be on the lookout for him, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, who would have thought that the 4473, the standard background check form that we have to fill out, does its fucking job and catches a lot of these people who have felony or misdemeanor charges and it's almost like if there was a system in place that didn't, you know, fuck with the computers or data in place, that it might be running, you know, a lot better than it is now and be able to catch a lot more people than it does now. You know, whenever whenever I hear, oh, you know, criminals are going to, to gun stores and, and buying these weapons, I'm like, point me in the direction of, of where they're doing that, because apparently, you know, they're not taking 4473s and are probably making shit tons of cash but from every ffl that i know they have to fill out these forms they have to do the background check and generally when someone doesn't pass muster you know they get caught yeah it's interesting too like uh just late breaking google news uh uh looks like there were Roughly 39.7 million background uh, checks done in 2020, and um, more than 300,000 of them were blocked. Um, so, to your point, it's doing its job. Reminds me of that uh, journalist who tried to go buy a gun to show how easy it was, and he got blocked because he'd beaten his wife. <laughs> like, there was, uh, uh, that's awesome. That was mm -hmm. immensely was satisfying to watch. Came in, uh, at the start of the pandemic last year, and he dropped almost forty five, forty six thousand um, dollars, and selected a bunch of different firearms. And then when it was time to, you know, uh, do the background check for him, immediately, immediately just got a call from the local PD going, "Hey, is this guy in your store right now?" And uh, ding, 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 winner, hmm. winner, winner. Forty six thousand dollars in guns. Wow. Um. Well, I mean, good place. I hope. Was he at least buying like decent guns? Oh no! Just bought out your entire Here. stock of yeah, Tauruses. Uh, There's all points. high points. Well, he didn't have any high points, but he was uh, buying Tauruses, <laughs> SCCYs, a number of Turkish yep. light shotguns. Oh. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> and PSA ARs on co-signment. Uh, Bubba fucked uh, Milserps. 
and then a bunch of ammunition. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that... Mm. That's sad. <laughs> that just that seems like a red flag there. Uh you know <laughs> I am sad for that guy. Yeah. <laughs> now and high points least... are very good if you are poor and would it's like to defend yourself. Option. But if you're dropping forty six thousand dollars, at least get a decent Glock oh, or something. Gosh. Come on, man. Uh yeah. it's just sad. It's well, enough to buy uh, like two, three Barretts. I think the the funniest part was the ARs that he was yep. buying and some of the Turkish delights did not have sights at all. Not once did he buy like an optic or anything. No. Oh. <laughs> I wonder what he was trying to use those for. Hey man, he's just a small business owner coming to restock. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I guess in his defense, like maybe he could have been like trying to just like resell them on gun broker or something like that at ridiculous <laughs> prices, you know, get in on the gun scalping. The police market. are just saving us from the scalpers. <laughs> yeah. That's all they the were cops doing. Were like, no, I want those. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, that's, that, that's really sad. I mean, I know a bunch of people who did buy a bunch of guns at the beginning of the pandemic and it was a wise move on their part. I'll give them that. Yeah, and there always seems to be, like, a spike in sales, like, when a new administration comes on board anyway, especially when it's Biden and he's, like, tried to do an assault weapons ban. Oh, no. Obama but, and uh, Biden have been the best gun salesmen in the last 20 years, easily. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, speaking of new items for sale, uh, the next one's kind of fun. Um in the pistol caliber carbine market, uh, CAA, they're makers of the MCK and Micro Rhodey uh, gun, you know, braces for clocks. Um, they're actually coming out with their own pistol caliber carbine. Um, I knew you shared this one, Raph. So, uh, seems yeah, seems kind of cool. Um, this is the one that Citizen Hush was telling us about last week. Yeah, it's based on the P320 fire control unit, so you can take the little metal piece out of your pistol and put it in this carbine and. He says it's lovely, um, especially compared to any other, you know, pistol conversion uh, PCC. Yeah, fun fact in California about uh, the uh, conversion kits, they are legal to own in the state. But uh, the minute you put a gun inside of them, they suddenly become illegal. Um, so I'm pretty I mean, sure they're just illegal to own here. They, they don't. They don't let us have the fun things, let alone use them. Yeah, it, it's bizarre. I mean, it's like if you go to Bass Pro Shops, they they have them for sale. Um, and then it's just like you buy them and the clerk says, OK, you know, you can't actually use this right. That, uh, you know, they they wouldn't uh, keep restocking if people weren't buying them. So I don't, I don't know what they're yeah. doing with them. You know, wait, wait, um, nudge, nudge, nothing. I mean. I mean, I guess, you know, there's a lot of pools in California. So, uh, you know, if you have one and you use it in a defensive situation, just throw it in your neighbor's pool and uh, present the uh, naked Glock to the police or something. This is not legal advice, um, but I'm yeah, yeah. only imagining a scenario here. Yeah, I'm, I think we should just bleep over everything you just said so that nobody knows how bad advice it is. Yes, um, terrible <clears throat> advice. Terrible advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, the next one, uh, basically, Chinese immigrants are buying guns. This is not a shock. And yeah, this is kind of like the same story we've seen kind of all year. It's just, oh, minorities are realizing that, guess what? The yeah. cops aren't there to help them the either. Green, and the sky is blue it's and up to them. Other minorities need to defend themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is i mean it's 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 like a new subgroup every week that the news suddenly realizes oh these people have their own agency and yeah. i oh know. what's that over there yeah yeah well it was npr that covered this one too which i was kind of surprising uh were they trying well, to like make them look bad no i mean it was a surprisingly objective story i mean and that that's kind of like been my experience too like when you know we did that like chat with cnn there's a lot of journalists out there that are just like what like minorities are buying guns this is interesting and they're they actually are barely like objective and curious about it um 
And like, I kind of found the article and the piece to be really well written and objective. They were just kind of like, you know, trying to figure out, oh, well, well, why are you buying a gun? Um, you know, so obviously like the tone was a little bit like out of concern, but you know, they gave airtime to a lot of people because they're having, you know, like legitimate reasons for it and not, uh, you know, your strip goal, uh, Bubba wearing a MAGA hat. So it's, uh, good to see. Yeah. I think, I think part of this is it breaks the narrative. Like if, if somebody looks at me, they're like, oh yeah, I bet that guy has a gun. And yeah, I mean, I look like the kind of person who would, according to the the stereotypes in this country. Um, but people aren't expecting a Chinese American Silicon Valley engineer to have a gun. And I think this just, and I think journalists are especially, um, you know, thanks to the, their political leanings are especially susceptible to that, uh, that yeah. bias I, or that you know, preconception. The unexpected gun owners group. You know, when most people kind of meet me for the first time, I'm like talking about my hobbies. I'm like, oh, you know, I love like painting miniatures and video games. I'm a huge anime fan. I also own like 14 different rifles and 17 handguns. That they're like, how huh, was that last part? <laughs> uh, and it definitely shows that. Well. Um, when some of the more regular customers come in who kind of fit the stereotypical gun owner profile, uh, if it's their first time seeing me, they do a bit of a double take. And I'm always happy to be like, oh, how can I help you today, sir? What can we get you set up with? What are you shooting today? Um, on the the thing about minorities buying, uh, or Chinese Americans especially, and kind of the new cycle of different minority subgroups coming up, I'm seeing that a lot as well. Um, definitely within the past year or so, uh, a lot more Asian Americans have been coming in. But the two things that have really been kind of surprising and heartwarming is older Asians coming in with like their nieces and nephews or their sons and daughters um, buying a gun for the first time, learning how to use it and kind of bonding with uh, their kids over it. Because, you know, sometimes we do have like uh, younger adults who have been coming to the range for a while and this is their first time bringing like a family member or their parent or even just like a friend uh, who is maybe a bit more hesitant on it. Um, I can tell you that we've been definitely doing a lot more safety classes, a lot more, um, intro introduction, like firearms courses than we have within like the past, uh, two, three years. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And like, I don't know, from what I've observed and like, according to the article, it's like, it's interesting because it's a variety of different income levels that are doing it. So, you know folks pretty much across the spectrum are purchasing firearms. Um, like one of the places mentioned in the article is the San Gabriel Valley, which like is basically kind of, you know, the real Chinatown of LA. Um, you know, if it's less touristy, it's where everybody actually lives. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of like pretty well off like Chinese and Hong Kongers that are just, you know, coming over for various reasons because of, you know, Winnie the Pooh and various policies and things like that. And, you know, buying nice houses and uh, word on the street has gotten out in the, the gang community and they've just been like targeting those areas and engaging in a lot of home invasions. Um, same thing like Oakland and San Francisco. I mean, there's like tons of stories. If you, you know, follow the right news people on Twitter of, you know, armed people just basically tying up people yet you know, like Asian families in their house and just robbing the blind because there's this perception that they have a lot of cash on hand. Um, and that was covered in the article. So it's just, uh, you know, not just hate crimes, but also crimes of opportunity are happening uh, more and more in the community. And it's uh, really sad, but at least people are, you know, taking matters into their own hands and defending themselves. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the theme we're seeing, uh, you know, with women making up nearly half of all new gun buyers and every single minority group spiking is essentially an equalization. It's just like, oh, uh, this is for us too, and this is th there's a reason that the uh, the stereotypical people do it, and we just didn't realize why yet, and now we do. That's uh, I think that's all it is. There's no there's not really anything behind identity. It's just that you know people who have been in the U.S. for longer they had more gun culture in the family. And now other people who haven't been here as long uh, generationally are realizing like, Oh, that's, 
what this is and that's that's what it's for and uh, i think i think it's just i don't think there's much of a narrative there i think it's just a very positive thing that you know we're we're all in this together we're we're a melting pot and uh now we're a well-armed melting pot <laughs> spicy yeah don't 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 tell that to david hogg he had some uh twitter post today i should pull it up because he referenced salad tossing without realizing I it saw was like, that. Oh. Yeah, that was. Oh man, I should pull up <laughs> the exact tweet, but man, did he walk into that one? <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> something special, and I mean special yeah. in the in the in the cruel sense. Um, I was I was amazed that he uh, hadn't managed to slip up by now. Yeah, I think um, did he delete it? Oh, I hope he didn't. Uh, I, I mean, we definitely trolled him, and Mom at Arms did too, which was uh, glorious earlier. Um, it's great real time radio looking up tweets from David Hogg, but I mean, I have to say, like, he is the most unintentionally funny anti gun person on Twitter recently. Uh, he's been on Twitter for a long time, and he's been pretty dumb for a long time. So, uh, yeah, no. He uh, he deleted the salad. He toss? deleted he deleted the salad toss tweet. Oh no! Oh, that means all of our retweets and comments got uh, got lost there. Oh well, I'm sure. I, I'm pretty sure Mom at Arms like screenshot it. So no, follow no, Mom no, at Arms nope. on Twitter. Nope, so this there. is an old tweet that got uh, that got brought back up. Oh okay. <clears throat> so here's the tweet by David Hogg at David Hogg one one one. America is not a melting hog. Yeah, America is not a melting pot. It's an extremely segregated salad held in a bowl built of institutionalized injustice, violence, and genocide. It's time for us to toss the salad and abolish the bowl. <laughs> and and then then he tweeted. Then he subtweeted it and was like, "I've just been informed this has a different meaning." <laughs> well, I'm I'm pretty sure Mom's demand action knows full well what the meaning of that is. Uh, seems oh, like something that's Lord. right up their alley. The uh oh wow, we just need to build a new BDSM, but with uh yeah, David Hogg, Mom's Demand. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's mm. probably like a you know dirty anti-gun convention that's just you know an orgy like a furry fest somewhere I'm happening sure in the world what they call after COVID. I don't know the profession a e circle jerk. Something like that. Um, Something like that, yeah. There's also, it's also worth noting that, I mean, the furries are kind of on our side with this one, at least as far as I've been able to tell. <laughs> as ironic <laughs> as it is, we may have found ourselves so a, uh, when the kings have to choose, an ally. When, when kinky people have to choose yeah. the side they're on. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, that should be a poll question. Like, how many furries conceal carry? And where do they conceal carry it? Are they more, more than you think? Appendix? And yep. uh, furs suits are huge. Those things, those things uh, yeah, hide guns very well. Carrying a 16-inch uh, FAL OSW. With the red tip. Nice. Yeah, red rocket furry. It just uh, kind of all goes together. All right. Um. All right. Whoa. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, what is with if, us? Yeah, tonight? if you this have is... male puppies when they get to the six month mark, you're in for a treat. Let me just say, yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right, moving on from Red Rocket references. Um, massive violations and... of privacy coming up next. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, massive violations of privacy in California. Um, Gavin Newsom recently passed a law that uh, basically allows the release of. Um, our gun registry data to any university or academic institution that request it. Um, so for those of you that don't know, California does have a gun registry, but it's not public. It's like only available to law enforcement. So it's like every time you buy a gun, it just gets recorded and goes into a database. Um, ostensibly their excuse is like, well, no one's going to see it, but the right people. Well, now they just signed into law a bill 
that would allow all of that information to be available to your average 19 year old UC Berkeley student? What could possibly go wrong? Oh, so much doxing, so many lawsuits. And uh, I, I somehow think that those people aren't going to be attacked. Um, oddly enough, I don't feel like that's going to be the result of this. And if that is the result of this, I, I'm not saying that the that the results would be funny, but the irony would be palpable. Yeah, I mean that. I guess like the best argument that I heard against it was, well, what if like a criminal enterprise pretends to be an academic institution and requests the data? Then all of a sudden they have a registry of you know who to rob. Yeah, um, I, I, it's probably I, unlikely, but yeah, it's possible. Somehow, I think those people won't necessarily be targeted for violence. Just, I, I'm not sure if people are that stupid. I mean, if you have a list of people with guns, are those the people you're going to try to target for crimes? Yeah. Exactly. However, it's I mean, still it a looks- massive violation of privacy, and considering California's weak self-defense laws, um, I don't think that's. It, 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 there's no way this is a positive thing. Now, say in Tennessee, if this happened, I mean, (laughs) yeah. Well, nice segue. Tennessee. uh, This is really horrible because it was a mass shooting in Tennessee. But, uh, hey, that's that's how we uh, get through our news. Um, So, yeah, I mean, essentially, the story here is uh, the shooter was a third-party vendor for Kroger. He shot about 15 people, unfortunately one fatally, um, had no history of violence as of uh, last Friday. Um, The interesting part about this, uh, you know, obviously, you know, hearts go out to the families, but moms demand action um, other than, you know, requiring salad tossing uh, at every one of their events, um, successfully lobber, lobbied Kroger to actually ban open carry and concealed carries in their stores. Um, so even though Tennessee passed um, constitutional carry recently, no one could have actually intervened because they set their own rules, no shirt, no <laughs> shirt, shoes, no service, no Glocks. Um so it, it's kind of ironic. Yeah, well, um, so I have a good bit of family in Tennessee, and I can assure you that nobody listens to that. Um, and most of the Kroger employees hate it, too. Uh, that's just kind of how it works there. The second thing is in Tennessee, they're allowed to legally bar you from having firearms in there. The only thing they're allowed to do if they catch you with a concealed firearm is tell you to leave. Um, it's not a criminal charge. They can trespass you, and that's it. Um, but the other thing is mom at arms is trying to dunk on Tennessee for, you know, having constitutional carry, uh, completely ignoring that this amazingly incompetent mass shooter, uh, used a long rifle, not a pistol. Ah, interesting. Yeah. He used a, he would fall in the 2.2% of, uh, murders, uh, in the FBI stats. Yeah. Um, and he, he shot 15 people and only one died, which, um, yeah, this is – it is both a horrible mass shooting and a horrible mass shooting. Yeah, pre- pretty much all we have to say on that. I mean, I'm sure as they do some digging, there's probably something in this guy's history that uh, made uh, made him do this and possibly could have been red flagged because uh, that's generally the MO for mass shooters. But, uh, you know, there's also – strong possibility that we might not ever actually know the reason just like the uh the las vegas shooter because he by all accounts was totally normal other than having a ridiculously large arsenal um so it's like yeah how, how do you wrong how with do you having a large that? arsenal yeah exactly i mean uh <laughs> yeah that's part of the reason why i'm not uh not wanting uc berkeley to uh have access to my info now yeah, i'll just get picketed yeah um yeah Horrific, relatively not deadly, um, and I'm really sad that nobody felt safe enough to carry in that store because they could have uh, hopefully stopped that or at least distracted the shooter before a lot more people got hurt. Um, yeah, Kroger, you should really repeal that policy because it could have saved lives. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, and uh, speaking of prevention, the next story... Uh, Man, I am on fire there, with these segues. I know, we, we really are on fire with the segues there. We, we programmed this well this week. Um, a study just found uh, that, uh, according to the U.S. Department of Justice National Crime Victimization Survey, um, there are actually far more gun uses than uh, actual murders, uh, Defensive within, gun uses. Uh, defensive oh, gun uses. Legally murder. justified defensive gun uses. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, I mean, this is this should be obvious. So how many people do you know who've used a gun defensively? All right, you're in California. Yeah, I'm um, in California. Sorry. <laughs> I, I can... I mean, if you count my, my grandparents, you know, in World War II and Korean War, respectively, then two. <laughs> <laughs> I know of... Three people, one guy that did it twice. Yeah, I've only done it once, um, but I have, and I know many, many other people who have as well. Um, I should also specify that in both instances, um, he did end up having to pull the trigger, unfortunately. Oh, really? Is he a law enforcement officer? No. Whoa. Well, that's some yeah. really bad luck. Yeah, no, I didn't have to even point. Yeah, I was very lucky. Um, just the presence of a gun deterred the situation, and that was I was very grateful for that. Um, because contrary to what you might think, I don't want to kill anybody. That doesn't sound like fun. Um, that's part of the yeah. reason why I have a Desert Eagle too, because I like part of me feels like okay, if you point that at someone's face and say "Get the fuck out of here," they're gonna listen. Yeah, I, th I think. No, that it's not just the imposing factor that Desert Eagle. Any gun just instantly changes the dynamic of a situation. Uh, you change from the victim of a potential crime or potential victim of a crime into uh, you have two options here, and they're leave or leave or die. And that's that's just how this works. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, almost, this... I always wonder, like, do people actually have that movie trope cliche of like? You don't have the guts to pull the trigger, or do they just like shit their pants and run? I don't. I, I'm, nobody, I'm nobody, the nobody goes. You don't have the guts to pull the trigger. Generally, what happens <laughs> uh, is somebody, if they're if they didn't expect a gun to be in the scenario, and they see a gun, they leave because nobody wants to get shot. If they did expect the gun to be in the scenario and the gun comes out, they leave. The exceptions generally are when somebody's on serious amounts of drugs or there's like a domestic incident going on um but those like most defensive handgun uses most defensive gun uses don't uh don't involve any shots being fired yeah i'm kind of thinking the drug uses are probably the only case where you would see villain level monologuing happening but you probably wouldn't understand what the hell well, they're that's saying, what but... you see that's what you see in like if you watch donut operator on youtube he's a youtuber who does uh police shooting breakdowns he takes publicly available videos of police shootings and breaks them down the people who are aggressive towards cops and pull guns on cops those people are generally on some really hard drugs um or general they're looking for uh, yeah, suicide by cop is. Ticket. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another option. But like, uh, those aren't the norm, and that generally really happens to cops, not civilians. Um, but the statistics are fascinating. Um, so, uh, I believe the DOJ estimates that there's around a hundred thousand, and then the next one is seventeen other surveys indicate between seven hundred and sixty thousand and three point six million. Per year? That's absurd. Yeah. Why aren't we hearing about this? This is that, like, even if not all of them were necessarily life saving, some of them were, you know, say you're trespassing, which is still legal in many places, but not a, not a, you know, necessarily saving a life. That's just absolutely mind blowing. Well, what's kind of nuts is that uh, as of August 1st, 2021, when this report was published, uh, major publications like the New York Times, Washington Post, and LA Times, uh, even the Wall Street Journal only featured about 10 news stories on uh, gun uses used in a defensive scenario to stop a crime versus 1,700 stories about murders or murders, gun fire, etc. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's have not you... news when somebody defends themselves without firing a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys heard of – I feel like I've brought this up before – the the man bites the man bites dog fallacy. I think I've brought this up. Yes. Yeah, that there it is. It's the idea that someone defends himself with a firearm is supposed to be very normal and very like common. But news media wants to paint a certain picture and so they're gonna be latching on to instances where something else happens, like the whole like the Tennessee Kroger shooting. That is a very rare occurrence of something like that happening. Right. And, I mean, they're they're sensationalized. I mean, in Tennessee alone, Mm -hmm. I guarantee you more people's lives were saved this year than people's lives were taken in mass shootings um, by defensive defensive gun usages. I will bet good money on that. Um, I'm aware of the area. um, And even just in Memphis, which is where this, near where this happened. Um... I I promise you that's that's the case, but that's not news. Well, plus Elvis isn't around to shoot TVs anymore, so I got I don't know where that falls into the uh, category um, of. I mean, sh- <laughs> shooting a TV these days is probably just considered a positive mental health move, <laughs> <laughs> depending on the channel, right? Yeah, as long as you do it in a safe setting, I'm not recommending you just walk into your mom's living room and. Unload into the TV, but uh, if you'd like to have a little bit of recreational boom boom, I think uh, an old tube is uh, shooting an old tube TV is actually a lot of fun. They go, they they explode um, in a very satisfying way. Yep. Yeah. One of, one of my favorite parts of uh, 1989 Batman with Michael Keaton, Joker shooting the TV. It's a it's a good time. Uh, and also, Batman. Bob, gun. <laughs> Wait, was that the one where the Joker had the really, really long gun in his pants? Yeah, he had a, yeah, he had the It was like a 36-inch barrel revolver yeah. that he just had stuck down his pant leg. Yep. I'm not exaggerating, he, it was literally a 36-inch barrel. And when he shot down the bat wing with it, too, which is the most One impressive part about it. Yep. Yeah, just just like... Oh, I don't know what the old stance is called. It's, there's Weaver, Isosceles. Those are the modern two-handed stances. Eugene, do you know the name of the old single-handed handgun firing stance? Where you're, like, standing, like, uh, with your body aligned with your arm, like, sideways to present a smaller target? Oh, oh, I know the one you're talking I really about should know this. And, um, like, minimize their profile. Yeah, the old style before... Uh, before Anybody knew anything? <laughs> oh man, no. Hmm. Yeah, what's the like <sighs> Luger World War II P thirty eight stance where you put your hand on your hip and just like one handed? I mean, that's still a common thing for, uh, for example, Olympic speed shooting, where you're shooting a mm-hmm. very low mm-hmm. recoil web on twenty two, uh, just because. Um, the single hand lets you apparently have more control or more flexibility. Yeah, I'm rapidly Googling this uh, handgun firing stance. Nice. Well, um, in other self-defense news, our next story involves a uh, military person who was uh, found not guilty in uh, self-defense against the police. Um, so basically last year during the riots in Minneapolis, CCW holder named, uh, Jaleel Stallings. It's um, called bladed by the way, the, the stance. Ah, bladed. Well, we don't know whether or not he was using bladed stance or not, but, uh, at the end of the day, uh, an unmarked police car, um, came up to him. Police didn't identify themselves, started shooting at him with, you know, 40 millimeter rubber bullets out of actual firearms. And so he defended himself. Uh, No one died, thankfully. Um, But, you know, as soon as he realized they were cops, they proceeded to beat the crap out of him uh, for over 30 seconds, which you can catch on webcam video. Um, But long, well, body cam video anyway. Long story short, though, um, he was able to successfully defend himself. and was found not guilty in that incident because of uh, 
you know, self-defense against the cops who did not uh, wear uniforms or identify themselves as such. So, you know, to me, I think that's uh, that's kind of a good precedent. Yeah, I mean, just because you're a cop doesn't mean you're allowed to uh, just not identify yourself and start assaulting a civilian. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that's a... Uh, that that's the correct ruling um if they're you know acting as an officer of the law they need to identify themselves as such that's generally in police training and yeah if not bad shit is going to happen and that's just how the world works yeah it's it's unfortunate that humanity hasn't evolved to the point where we are all psychic and can read people's minds to uh, determine their intentions uh so until we reach that evolutionary flashpoint Probably letting people know that you're a cop when you're busting down their door yeah. or doing something to them is probably a very good way to avoid being shot back. Yeah. You have that liability shield for a reason. You want to you wanna use that if you're, if you're actually, you know, doing something within the scope of your official duties. Yeah, just kind of takes me back to Brianna Taylor. I mean, that's one of the most heartbreaking stories out there, um, as far as I'm concerned. And I was always kind of surprised that nobody in the gun movement really seemed to kind of come to her defense on that, like the NRA especially. Because um, yeah. case in point, un you know, ununiformed police officers knocking on your door in the middle of the night without declaring that they're actual police. I mean, who wouldn't, if they had the means to defend themselves, take advantage of that uh when someone's busting down your door uh you know inadvertently you know yeah i think that um i think that you weren't talking to the right gun people at the time because the gun people who we talk to now uh they are all oh, yeah. overwhelmingly on the side of brianna taylor and kenneth walker kenneth walker walked um and i'm very glad about that because this it was basically uh a very it was a very similar case he shot at cops not knowing they were cops they didn't identify themselves and they were assaulting his house and that this is extremely reasonable yeah especially when it's the wrong house uh you know, yeah and, i don't that was the case there yeah i don't think this should really be like a big deal it's like well the cops did a, a foxy woxy and they found the outsy that i'm never saying yep. that again that was that was horrifying <laughs> well you know i mean speaking it's, of horrifying it's only going to youtube we have news about the president. How's that for a segue? <laughs> yes, horrifying. Zombie Biden photos I've seen, like a couple of them popping up recently, or like I I'm just waiting for somebody to do like, I don't know, son of like uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. He chose poorly, but with Joe Biden morphing into a skeleton. There's all actually um I know you jest, but there's an entire subset of the population who believes that Joe Biden has been replaced uh, with a body double. Like a body double in makeup? Like a body double who got some plastic another... surgery and the, Joe oh, okay. Biden's actually not been alive for, like, since just after the election. There's a whole thing around this. So it's like the movie Dave, but with a 77-year-old? Something like that. Like, this is a thing that a lot of people believe. Um, Have yeah. you ever seen the movie, Dave? It's like Kevin Klein is president. It's the same scenario. It's like the real president has a heart attack with his mistress, and then this guy looks exactly like him because it's the same actor, and then he just pretends to be the president. I have not seen that. Oh, it, it, it's like a... a like The classic... 90 ish mid 90s movie it's actually pretty good and i think it's so uh, will be a classic in the future but it's not yet not yet not okay. yet but uh it's a good one i think sorkin did it if i'm not mistaken really or that might have been the american president i'm not sure it's a good one though look it up it's it's probably I mean, I it's probably not popular enough to be on Netflix, let's be honest, but it's probably on, like, Tubi or one of those random sites that just, like, hoovers up crappy movies that, like, weren't quite hits from years past. But we had it on Laserdisc in the Kane household uh, growing up, so that was fun. 
dear old dad, uh, he, he kind of missed out on all the home video markets there. So he had Betamax. And then instead of getting a VH- VHS player like a sensible person, he got a Laserdisc player. Um, and I'm pretty <laughs> sure he had HD DVD, too, instead of Blu-ray. Um, so he's like three for three on that. I would have liked to know his stock choices because I could then buy the opposite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like he had the opportunity to buy Apple and did not buy it and bought uh, Tandy or something. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's such a bad choice that I don't even, I don't even know the name of the company. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's like CX Spectrum. I don't know. Uh, well, moving well, on, let, we were yeah. actually going to talk about the news in that, but we kind of forgot. <laughs> we did forget the news. Yeah, we totally forgot the news on the uh, the poll, which said that sixty eight percent of Americans disapprove of the president's performance on gun policy, and. Uh, before you say, well, maybe it's because they don't think he's doing enough. Um, the poll was basically uh, pretty bipartisan. So it was like Republicans were 79% disapprove, 30% of Democrats actually disapproved, and 58% of independents disapproved as well. Um, so in total, only 24% of people approved of Biden's performance on guns and this is a uh, survey that kind of goes out from the economist uh, every month um looks like it was a 10 percent drop from june yeah i think chipman uh chipman being dropped really hurt his uh his optics on that yeah i mean thank goodness he was dropped yeah. Oh, I don't. He wouldn't. He would have been dropped eventually, anyway. Yeah. Out of, I mean, outside the um, the gun control stance, I think the turning point for a lot of like left, more left leaning people, um, that made them kind of reconsider their support of Biden. I, I, I gotta say, I think there was probably Afghanistan. Yeah. And mm. I think with that it opened their eyes to a lot of other issues about him. It was just, that was the final straw, which broke the camel's back that opened a lot of people's eyes to, wow, he is doing a really shit job overall. Yeah. I mean, I don't yeah, know case why. In point, Bi- yeah. Biden voter here. <laughs> That's, that was definitely it for me. Uh, hands are clean. Yeah. I voted for Joe Jorgensen. Thank you very much. Good old Joe. Independent Joe. parties. Woo. Yeah. Man. Well, my vote doesn't matter in this state. So, it, it doesn't matter my state either, honestly. Yeah. Now, Eugene, you're in a you're in a purple state. You're you're facing judgment. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. yeah. But I will I will stand by I'll stand by my decision. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but I think this is generally kind of how it works. People vote for the president. They realize he's a bad choice. Like a year later, they're <laughs> sad about it. Midterms happen. It's just. It's just uh, the normal cycle of politics. It's just that we've gotten a bit more extreme and quite a bit more uh, authoritarian. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, I felt like the best shot the Libertarian Party had was uh, Gary Johnson. But no, Bill it was Weld Ron Paul. Sh- Bill, Bill Weld should have been the president and he should have been the VP pick because I – yeah. The Libertarian Party or the Libertarian Party. I mean, Ron Paul was a libertarian. Oh, yeah. He ran as sure. a Republican because well, he, was, he wasn't yeah. stupid. It's like a Bernie uh, Sanders scenario where he, like, caucused with them, right? Uh, he wasn't – I don't believe he was registered as a libertarian, um, but he supported the Libertarian Party. He just knew that in order to make any difference, he had to be a Republican. But uh, in terms of libertarianism being at, you know, at the forefront of anything, Ron Paul was was it. And uh, I'm sad he's retired now. Yeah, exactly. He he would be interesting, you know, in Congress still. I mean, is he technically younger than Biden? Let me look that up. Uh, I think they're the same age. Yeah, it's like why 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 didn't you stay in Congress, Ron Paul? He was born on August twentieth, nineteen thirty five. Let's see, when was Biden born? Where is Wikipedia?
Okay, here we go. 1942. Okay, so Ron Paul is older than Joe Biden. But he's way more coherent still, so. Good genes. I, I've always been kind of disappointed in Rand Paul, honestly, to, you know, not being quite as cool as his dad. But he's, yeah, been, well, he's been kind of on a roll semi-recently, I feel like. Wow, that is harsh. You will <laughs> never be like your father. <laughs> oh, Ah. Yeah, well, I mean, Ron Paul's a very hard guy to live up to. Indeed. All right. Well, yeah, that actually, that rounds up our news. And uh, I feel like we have not had a weird gun of the week because we ran out of weird guns. So I guess we can skip that segment and uh, call it a day. Um, any Any final thoughts, guys? All in all, I think things are looking up for a lot this year. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I feel a lot more positive after getting through the news. Um, yeah. I mean, if, like... if Biden can't get the debt ceiling passed, then, uh, you know, what hope does he have for gun control? I think none. I think, I think that's right. I mean, it seems to be what happens in Democratic administrations. Um in the first couple of years, there's a lot of push to get gun control passed. And unfortunately, that takes a lot of political capital. Uh, Biden currently has everything he can handle trying to get, you know, the Senate, which is ostensibly controlled by his party, in line. And it's just not happening. Yeah, I'm kind of predicting he's not going to have any legislative accomplishments worth mentioning, really, at this point, um, which is good. I mean, I guess, you know, if somebody ends the filibuster, which, you know, not going to happen unless Joe Manchin gets hit by a truck, um, you know, things could change. But for now, it's kind of like he's sort of being forced into the caretaker presidency that a lot of people wanted uh, when they voted for him. I mean, you know, like or despise Trump. I mean, it's like, he, uh, you know, we shouldn't get too deep into the weeds on politics. Shouldn't get into it. Yeah, yeah, we shouldn't. We care about policy more, and this one has some pretty shit ones. So, yeah, let's hope that changes or he changes. Nice. Well, in this, this is the life of a single issue voter. Sometimes, you know. Yep. That's well, that's what I am. So yeah. Yep. Well, speaking of segues, uh, since you mentioned shit, I have to take one, so I'm going to end this podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and on that note. All right. So, yeah, be sure to like and subscribe, uh, you know, our channel um, uh, on YouTube and, uh, you know, give us a glowing five-star review on iTunes if you like what you heard here. Um, I believe we inadvertently streamed everything to Facebook uh, because we were playing around with the settings, so... If you're watching well, live, please send us an email, info at aapigo.net, and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, but otherwise, this is the uh, AAPI GoCast for September 30th, and we will see you next time.